Hello, welcome to the second lecture of the course uh, Demystifying the Brain. Uh, this lecture is about understanding the brain shape. So, we all know from our high school biology that uh, the brain has two hemispheres, uh, there is a little long tail like organ uh, called the spinal cord and then you have you know, pons, medulla and cerebellum and so you learn all these anatomical features of the brain. Uh, if you are a medical student and taking a course on neuroscience, uh, you might even uh, will be learning details like you know which part of the brain processes vision, which part processes touch and you know audition and you know motor function and things like that. And you will memorize all these facts and you know and produce reproduce them in the exams. But uh, this course is not about memorizing the details of the brain, this course is about the principles of the brain, the neural information processing principles of the brain. So, particularly in this lecture we will only try to understand the structural principles of the brain. So, we will try to ask uh, what are the evolutionary uh, forces right, that shaped the brain and made it the way it is today. So, in this lecture there are three segments. In the first lecture we will try to see if there is any correlation between brain size and intelligence. Because one of the things we would like to uh, uh, understand about brain is why is it so intelligent, what is it so special about it that makes it so intelligent. So, is there any connection with any of the structural properties of the brain. So, in segment 2 we will uh, invoke this principle called the save wire principle. So, brain takes a lot of uh, uh, pains uh, to make sure that the total wire in the brain is minimum. So, there is a so there is a strong evolutionary pressure uh, to minimize the wire length in the brain and we will also uh, try to argue uh, how it is related to a similar thing that we do in engineering. In engin engineers also very often uh, in you know especially electrical engineers who design circuits that try to minimize the total wire length. So, in the third segment we will study uh, brain's evolution. So, we will look at the uh, nervous systems of very simple creatures and you know go all the way to you know vertebrates and invertebrates, mammals and then finally, humans right and then see how brain has evolved and we will try to show how this how a very simple uh, uh, structural principle the severe principle can explain lot of features of uh, the brain's evolution. So, let us start with the first question brain size and intelligence. Right. So, let us start with a simple story. Uh, right. So, when you the moment you think of intelligence the first name that pops into your mind is probably that of right uh, Albert Einstein. So, he is one of the greatest geniuses you know of our times and uh, so you would you would often wonder what makes him so intelligent, uh, how, how come he is able to think so differently from everybody else. So, people have even uh, gone to the length of asking uh, is his brain something different I mean uh, what is special about Einstein's brain. So, after Einstein's death uh, his brain was removed uh, I think with his permission from his son. Uh, this was done by a person called Thomas Harvey a pathologist at uh, Princeton hospital. It was dissected roughly into 240 blocks uh, each of about uh, 10 cubic centimeters size and then it was preserved in a plastic like material called celloidin. And uh, so, a lot of structural anatomical studies were done on these blocks and there is a lot of story about how these blocks uh, you know went from place to place. and. Uh, people have several groups have studied these blocks and so on and so forth. I won't get into the history of uh, what happened to Einstein's brain. But to explain the findings of these studies, uh, I would first like to introduce a few uh, terms uh, to uh, to explain the features of you know brain's uh, uh, anatomy. So brain, as we know, uh, right, has two hemispheres. Uh, this you might have learnt in your high school, and uh, each hemisphere has several lobes. So, for example, the blue region that you are looking at is the frontal lobe. The yellow region is the parietal lobe. Uh, the temporal uh, lobe is the green region and the pink region is the occipital lobe. So, okay and uh, then we should also mention a few directions because we will use these terms again and again. As you know biology is a, is a lot to do with uh, jargon uh, although when you try to understand principles I mean jargon is not that important, but anyway just to connect with biological literature we will introduce and define the jargon. So, directions uh, up means superior or dorsal and down means inferior or ventral and front uh, means rostral, rostrum is nose. So, that is uh, rostral is front and anterior right is also front. Uh, caudal, cauda means tail, so caudal is back and uh, so right posterior is also back. Okay. So, then uh, you have uh, so medial is in the center or middle and lateral is to the side, uh, then bilateral is on both sides. Ipsilateral is, ipsilateral is on the same side as something that we are you know, discussing and contralateral is on the opposite side. Now, the section there is a coronal plane which cuts through the brain vertically like this uh, parallel to the plane of the face and the horizontal plane uh, cuts the brain uh, 
so that the plane is horizontal, parallel to the horizontal and uh, the sagittal plane is cu cuts the brain in the vertical plane like this and the mid sagittal plane cuts the brain exactly in the middle. Now, brain is basically a big network, right? it is a network of neurons. So, there are the nodes in the network and then there are the connections or the edges. Now, in, in, in this network of the brain, the nodes are basically masses of neurons, the cell bodies of the neurons and the edges are the neural fibers. Now, as it is typical in biology, these same things go by many names. For example, nodes are often nodes which are like masses of neurons uh, are called nucleus for example, if they are deep inside the brain. Uh, they also, we also call them gray matter and then the cortex which is the surface of the brain uh, which is a 2 to 5 millimeter thick sheet of neurons uh, right uh, that is that is again uh, that has a lot of neuron cell bodies. Then there are ganglia which are in the autonomous system there is little masses of neurons and the edges or wire uh, also go by many names there are tracts, peduncles, fasciculi, nerves and so on and so forth. Okay, so, basically it is a brain is a network with nodes and edges nodes are mass of neurons which go by all these names and the edges are wires which also go by many names. So, what is special about Einstein's brain? What are the main findings of these studies? The first feature that they found is that Einstein's parietal operculum region was missing. So, what is this parietal operculum? So, operculum means lid in Latin. So, uh, so this particular region is called the parietal operculum. Okay, what exactly is going on here? So, if you go back to the previous slide uh, where we saw the uh, the lobes right so you have this uh, fissure between the the frontal lobe and the temporal lobe it's called a sylvian fissure and then you have another fissure which is running uh, vertically that's called a central fissure so the sylvian fissure usually goes uh, beyond the central fissure and penetrates the parietal and the temporal areas up to a point now in einstein's uh, brain uh, so the the part of the sylvian fissure is actually missing and also if you open the brain right at the sylvian fissure right you will see a kind of a cave like uh, cavity and that is what you are looking at here and this roof is the parietal operculum. So, this parietal, parietal operculum region was missing in Einstein's brain. Uh, secondly the sylvian fissure was also partly absent right and uh, the third feature is that the inferior parietal lobe uh, was 15 percent wider than normal. So, uh, so the parietal lobe again if you go back to this figure right. So, this is the parietal lobe and uh, so this is the inferior part of the or lower part of the parietal lobe and this part is wider than uh, normal. So, this is actual uh, figure of Einstein's brain and uh, so you can see here that uh, so this is the parietal the inferior parietal lobe right and this region is wider than uh, normal people in Einstein's brain. The last feature is actually a cellular feature. So, in brain in addition to neurons there is a second category of uh, cells called the glial cells and uh, so for a long time people thought that, that uh, glial cells only perform some kind of a miscellaneous functions just supportive uh, uh, supporting the function of neurons. But work done over the last two and a half decades has shown that glial cells also participate in uh, neural information processing they work along with neurons and uh, you know and perform information processing. So, in Einstein's brain in the uh, left uh, inferior parietal area uh, people have found there are 73 percent more glial cells than uh, normal brains. So, what we can conclude is that Einstein's brain is slightly different from a normal brain, but it is nothing dramatic. I mean, so for all the intelligence that uh, the scientist has uh, exhibited in his work, uh, this brain is not that different from the brain of a you know typical person. So, where do we start? Okay, so, let us go further and let us not be too disappointed with this result and uh, let us look at some more like you know cerebral vital statistics, you know, some more basic uh, uh, structural properties of the brain and see if we can find some correlation with uh, intelligence. So, one of the first things that you that you can think of about brain right is that its size or its weight right are larger brains smarter. Okay, so, let us look at the weights of various uh, organisms various species uh, and see if uh, you know the size correlates with uh, intelligence in, in, in any sense. So, the weight of a newborn human is about you know 300 grams to 400 grams an adult human who is all educated and has right gone to college and, and has a degree I am just kidding uh, has a weight of about in you know, 1.3 to 1.4 kilos. Uh, then the elephant has in you know, a pretty large brain uh, that is about 4.7 kilos right and a dolphin is a very smart animal uh, that has about 1.5 to 1.6 kilos we are pretty close to and in fact slightly larger than human brain. Then the fin whales, whales generally all the whale species have very uh, large brains in fact they have the largest brains 
uh, in the animal world. Uh, so, that is uh, 6.9 kilos, then a gorilla has uh, about half a kilo uh, brain. If you look at other monkeys like rhesus, rhesus monkey has about 100 grams uh, brain and cow has about half a kilo, a cat is 30 grams and so if you look at a viper, it has a very tiny brain only 0.1 grams. Okay, so, if you think uh, that brains, inter, you know, intelligence is correlated with the brain's weight and it does not work uh, very well, uh, because the you would assume that you know, humans, we, are, we assume that humans are most intelligent and therefore, uh, we would expect us to have the largest brain, that, but that is not true, that elephants and whales have much larger brains than us. So, therefore, brain size does not in indicate intelligence. Okay, then what do we do? Uh, so, in fact, you might complain that the situation is a lot like what you see in this cartoon, uh, because here all these animals are asked to you know, perform the same task, you know, take the same exam. Uh, so, what this guy is saying is for a fair selection, everybody has to take the same exam, please climb that tree. So, what we have done just now is probably something like that, you know, you might complain. Uh, so, that is not fair, uh, because so, the thing is a large animal would need a larger brain, right, to control that huge body. Okay, so, for example, if you comparing uh, whale's brain with human brain is not fair, you might say, because, you know, a human uh, body weight is about 70 kilos and brain weight is 1.3 kilos, whereas uh, a sperm whale. Uh, is a is like in a huge uh, hunk, right? Has about 35 to 57 tons of body weight, uh, whereas the brain weight is only 7.8 kilos. So maybe just comparing the raw uh, weight of the brains is not fair. Uh, you, you should probably compare brain weight as a ratio of some, uh, uh, body weight. So let us do ex just that, and then like let's look at some data. So this uh, quantity called brain weight by body weight is called E by S ratio. E stands for encephalon, which means uh, head or the brain and S stands for soma or the body. So, let us look at the E by S ratios of uh, several species. So, birds have uh, this ratio of about 1 by 12 and humans 1 by 40, mouse right is as about same uh, same value as ours. Uh, so, the 1 by 40 and cat is 1 by 100, dogs 1 by 125 and so on. So, for hippopotamus right uh, by virtue of its you know uh, large corporeal frame right has a very small E by S ratio and so on. So, so, what we conclude from the E by S ratio data is that bird brains are smarter. Now, when you call somebody a bird brain, it is you know you treat it as an insult, but here you know by the measure of E by S ratio, birds turn out to be the smartest, right? And mouse is uh, just as smart as humans, and uh, brain weight in certain vertebrates uh, does not generally appear to increase linearly with uh, body weight. Uh, also, many smaller mammals have larger E by S ratios than that of humans. So, something has gone wrong again, and uh, you know, then let us we need to conclude that uh, perhaps E by S ratio is not a very good index of intelligence. Okay. So, then can we go further, can we make a small correction to make it more sensible. So, what people have thought is maybe we should not assume that E and S are uh, proportional, maybe there is a power law relating E and S. Okay. How did uh, people uh, arrive at that uh, kind that idea? The arguments go something like this. Right, imagine your body is like a sphere, I mean no offense, uh, because mathematicians like to idealize things and you know compare uh, real world objects with ideal geometric objects. So, just for sake of mathematical simplicity, let us assume that the body is like a sphere and inside this large spherical body and somewhere you know, in the center, let us assume there is a small spherical brain and now which is this brain is just a mass of neurons and these neurons have sending out their, uh, their axons, their wires right and to innervate the entire body and reaching all the way to the surface of the body, which is the surface of the sphere. So, the brain has to innervate the entire surface of the uh, spherical body, right. The greater the surface area, the more the number of fibers that the brain has to send out to the surface and uh, the more the number of fibers, the more the number of neurons that the brain has to have and more the number of neurons, the greater the brain weight. Okay. So, the, uh, the argument here is that body weight is proportional to the volume of the sphere, which is uh, assuming the density is constant. Right. So, therefore, the volume of sphere is 4 by 3 pi r cube, okay. whereas the brain weight is uh, since it is the number of fibers is proportional to the surface area and surface area of the sphere is uh, 4 pi r square. Right. So, therefore, brain weight is supposed to be proportional to 4 pi r square. So, if you assume this, you know, if you buy this argument, then you have to you know, accept that the brain weight E is proportional to the body weight S to the power of 2 by 3. So, you have some kind of power law relating uh, brain weight and body weight. So, then people decide to fit this kind of a power law to the brain and body weights of uh, real animals, right, various species. 
So, so E is equal to some constant proportionally constant C times S to the power of R uh, where R is the exponent uh, which is equal to 2 by 3 or 0 0.66 and, and uh, C is a cephalization factor you know it tells you how, uh, how, how much the, that animal is cephalized or right is endowed with a brain. Now you take so people have fitted this kind of formula to different species they did not just take fit a common formula to all the species uh, because that does not make sense. Uh, so, they have fitted this formula to various uh, individual species. So, for example, if you fit this formula to the average animal, you get some value of C and that is called the C average mammal. Okay, then fit it to some other species which, with which, which you want to compare with the average mammals, the, the mammals right and then you get a different C. So, now take the ratio of the C that you get from your test species and uh, with the C of the mammals. Right, so you get C by C average mammal, and this quantity is called the encephalization quotient or EQ of that species. So this abbreviation EQ is slightly misleading because you know it sounds like IQ, but actually, uh, as of now, it doesn't really correlate with IQ. We don't know. We can't say anything at the moment. But you know that that's the kind of abbreviation that is used. So what does this EQ mean? If a species has an EQ of 2.0, it means that its brain is twice as large as expected for a mammal of comparable weight. Okay, so if this is how this EQ is, is uh, measured and defined. So in this figure, you have uh, the body weight and the brain weight. Uh, brain weight is shown in gram, body weight is in, in kilograms, and both are shown in log scale because uh, that's when you get a. Since you have power law, if you express both these quantities in log scale, you get a linear fit. So they fitted that, and you see the kind of two polygons in this figure, and the the top polygon is uh, for uh, higher vertebrates, right? And uh, the bottom polygon is for the lower vertebrates. And the C value for higher vertebrates turns out to be 0 0.07, and the C value for lower vertebrates turns out to be 0 0.007. So you get this kind of different C values, right? Take these quotients, and then calculate EQs, and let's see what you got. So for humans or for man, the EQ is 7.44. Uh, for dolphins, it is 5.31. For a chimpanzee, which is a very smart animal, it's 2.49. Dolphin is also a pretty smart animal. Uh, monkey is 2.09. And uh, so all these primates, right? These are considered uh, very smart. So the, all of them have a high EQ, uh, EQ, high EQ values with with humans having the highest. And then elephant 1.87, and so on and so forth. The rabbit has uh, 0.4, and so on and so forth. So all these uh, these uh, kind of analysis are kind of taken from this book by McPhail. So where do we stand? I mean, so we have looked at so we started with some simplistic measures, uh, you know, trying to correlate brain structural properties like weight and you know, weight, uh, brain weight, body weight ratio, and so on. Uh, we have tried to correlate these quantities with uh, intelligence, but it didn't work out. So then we defined this kind of a strange quantity called EQ. And uh, it, it it worked well. It it uh, kind of uh, it confirmed our intuitive ideas about uh, who is most intelligent, and so therefore for humans EQ is highest. So what is the conclusion? So the thing is, uh, EQ does, seems doesn't is not very convincing because it seems like kind of a some kind of a fit, right? Uh, so you, we already pre-decided who is most intelligent, and you have come up with some kind of a measure uh, which confirms that kind of intuitive belief. So maybe we need to go further uh, because these measures that we have looked at in this uh, segment of the lecture are gross structural features, right? Maybe we should look at the microscopic. Uh, structural properties of the nervous system to really understand uh, what is it that makes a brain intelligent. Thank you.